everybody and all the children um there's no kids church today you have to sit through my sermon i'm just kidding go ahead go ahead i scared you i scared you um there is a women's brunch couple announcements there is a women's brunch coming up april 9th at 11 a.m and you can register by jumping on our website and all of you ladies we need to get your name down we need to get things planned so um the flyers are back there also on the back of your outline today be sure to register 
and, um, and help us get our numbers together. The second thing is we have a Galt lunch today. So all those that are part of the Galt campus right after service today, our Life Center, which is also our offices, you can head that way. And we got a free lunch for you. We want to connect with you. And, um, and we can start things moving towards our launch, which happens in about a month from now, all right? So we're excited about that. So let's jump into worship. Let me pray over you today. God, we pray your blessing upon each person here today. God, we pray that you would pour out your power upon their lives, God. We thank you, Lord, that when we worship, God, as we pray, as we worship today, as we jump into your word, that you will show up, God, and you will work in our lives in the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen. Can we just, I just want to invite you to put your hands in front of you, right where you're at. Holy Spirit, pour out over this house today. Have your way in us and through us. Jesus, do what only you can do. We are ready and willing. our eyes on you. You have my attention. You have my affection. No longer I who live, but Christ in
nothing says I am guilty I point to the price you paid When something says I'm not worthy I point to that empty grave And just like Lazarus begin to thank you for all that you've done for me. Jesus, to fully praise you, it will take all eternity. And just like Lazarus, oh, you brought me back to life. You brought My 
next to you is singing right now right now in this moment we're gonna lift praise in this place lift a sound of praise in this place of who he is. Come on. The God who was. A God who was in this to come. The power of the risen one. A God who brings the dead to life. You're the God of miracles. church. Can we just lift our hands in the air just one more time. Receive the grace that is so freely given. Receive the mercy that is so freely given. Receive the love of God. The perfect love of God. Come on church. Come on. Sometimes we're just too hard on ourselves. You are covered in his perfect love. Oh, we receive your perfect love. Perfect. 
perfect love of God. One more time, one more time. No longer I who live, but Christ in me. For I've been born again. Now my heart is free. The hope of heaven before me. The grave behind. Hallelujah. Lord, you brought me back to life. We receive life from you, Lord. Abundant life. We receive you. We receive you. I receive you, Lord. And all that you have. May it be unto me according to your word. I receive you. Oh, how we need you. Jesus. 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 Lover of my soul. Him and we praise Him today. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody 
praise that amen. Come on, let's give the Lord praise. Amen. God is good. God is good. Well, praise the Lord. You can be seated. Everyone except for Alonzo Binion, you come on oh, up here because we've got one of our Navy guys here today. And I just want you guys to see this guy. All right, he grew up in our church, and so we got to just say hi to him. Come on, stand all the way up. I'm not going to have you say anything. I just want everyone to see you. So uh, welcome back. You're transferring, um, going to another place. Um, you're coming off the ship, and you just came back from a deployment, right? How long were you gone? Four or five months on a ship, er, uh, on an um, aircraft carrier. And so welcome back. You just got back from that, and now you're transferring. But this is your church. You grew up from like here here and so we're excited to see you and so welcome back i called you up to give me a hug though all right all right so it's good to see you welcome back alonzo and we always love it when you're when you're back with us today um we gave an offering um two weeks ago to our missionaries pastors that are serving in ukraine and i want to give you a little report on that offering and thank you mike um because that offering it was what the best offering we've ever taken it was eighty five hundred dollars in the last couple of weeks we've given ten thousand five hundred now so we've been able to increase what we've given let's praise the lord for that um this has gone directly to help the people in ukraine and i got a report about it this week i, I was spending some time with um with our missionaries there and she told me that they found a farmer who had two tons of potatoes and of course everything's very expensive there right now but because of our money they were able to spend a th send a thousand dollars there and buy all two tons to distribute among their church so praise the lord for that we we're able to really in a practical way help i was kind of doing the calculations two tons of potatoes i think that's eight or nine ten thousand potatoes that's a lot of potatoes isn't it and um so we were really able to help so thank you for your generosity and your partnership with the people in C ukraine and you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 24 today. Matthew chapter 24 is where we're going to be. We're in part three of our series on the end times, last times, the theological terms. We call it eschatology. And, you know, when we think in times, um, we often, our mind goes right to the devastation. It goes to the wars and the natural disasters and the persecution. And we, we get obsessed with things like the Antichrist and the mark of the beast and all the suffering and the evil and, and the destruction of the earth and the unraveling of mankind. Our mind goes to all the movies we've seen like Armageddon and, and with Bruce Willis and Ben Affleck and all of these types of movies that, that were designed to scare us. And, and the thing is, we've been talking about these because Jesus opens this passage by talking about some of these things. But, but if we stop there... We're doing an, a great injustice to the discussion of end times. Because the suffering, friends, I want you to, to hear me today. The suffering of the end times is swallowed up by the victory of the end times. I, I want you to hear me today. The suffering that, that is faced and, and we see in this passage, it will be swallowed up by the victory at the end times. That's why Jesus, at the beginning of the passage, he, he called it birth pains. How many of you ladies who have given birth look forward to the process of giving birth? You're like, it's going to be so much fun pushing this baby out of my body. Like, it's going to be awesome. None of you <laughs> look forward to the process. What you look forward to is the end result. And obviously, the end result makes the process worth it because most people here have more than one baby. You had two, three, four, for some people, six babies, right? Because the end result was was worth the process, the end result, the pain uh, uh, is, is outweighed by, by the end result you get with that, with that baby. So I brought today, my um, Alonzo will, will know what this hat means, but I brought my prized possession. Like, you can go steal my cars, you can burn my cars, you can take everything I have, but this is my prized possession. Um, a lot of you will know, how you'll have things like this, especially you fathers. This is my son's hat he had during boot camp. You remember this hat? Here, Alonzo, it says recruit on it, right? And so when you go into boot camp, you are a recruit. And you work hard. It's six weeks of, of working very hard. It's six weeks of torture. It's six weeks of being yelled at. It's six weeks of PTs. It's six weeks of not much sleep. It's all of this stuff. But the end of boot camp, um, these guys, there's a picture up there from their, from their, face, their Facebook that the Navy has. At the end of the, the day, once they've passed the last test, they go in and they swear in as a sailor and they take off the recruit hat and they're given a Navy hat. 
And it's a big day for these guys, right? Alonzo, like Judah said that there wasn't a person there with dry eyes. Like everybody's crying. It's such a big accomplishment after six weeks of being torn from your family and torn from everything that, that you know. To finally get the Navy hat is a big deal. Now, I've never been through boot camp. Some of you who have served, um, you've been through boot camp. So I don't really know what that looks like. But my dad did everything he could to scare Judah as he went into boot camp. Because my dad's a Navy guy, and he went through boot camp. So he told all the horror stories of boot camp and tried to make sure Judah understood what he was getting himself, himself into. So I knew that boot camp was going to be very, very difficult. During boot camp, I got a few letters from Judah, a couple letters. But I wrote him every every single day. And in the letters I wrote him, knowing that he was going through a very difficult season of his life, a very difficult challenge, I wrote things like this, son. Son, keep your eyes on the goal. Son, focus on the finish line. I wrote things like this to him. You can do it. I wrote things like this. Hey, don't forget that that at the end of the day, you're going to get the prize of the capping ceremony. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on what is to come. I know that things will be tough, son, but also know at the end there will be a reward. As I'm looking at this text, I believe that is exactly what Jesus is doing. He is, he is telling his disciples, listen, guys, I, I'm going to be honest with you about life. I'm going to be honest with you about the things that are going to come. Things are going to be hard. And in the first 28 verses of, of chapter 24, he lays out the pain. He lays out some of the persecution. He lays out some of the things that will happen. He says, I, I know that life is going to be filled with, with pain, but don't forget at the other side of the pain, there is a prize. Keep your eyes on the finish line. I want you to hear when we talk about in, in days and last days theology and all of, all of this stuff, the end is really not the end. Hear me today. The end is really just the beginning. We need to hold on. We did not give up because God has great things in store. And in verse 29 of chapter 24, Jesus describes to his disciples the finish line. He says, I, I know things are going to be tough. Here's all the stuff that's going to happen. But the end, disciples, is really the beginning. And he says this, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Verse 30, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory. Come on, let's give the Lord praise, amen. At the end of tribulation, you will see the Son of Man come with power and with glory, and he will send out his angels with a, with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, one from one end of the heavens to the other. Jesus talks to his disciples here, and it's recorded and passed on to us. He's saying, do, do not worry. Don't be afraid, guys. Don't give up. Don't cower. The moment that you think things could be over, the moment you think that it could not get any worse, look to the heavens because victory is coming, redemption is coming, salvation is coming, hope is coming, Jesus is coming. Listen, this moment is described throughout, throughout the scriptures. It's not just in one spot. It's all over the Bible. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet of the, sa the sound of the trumpet of God. Revelation 1, 7, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Revelation, or Matthew 16, 27, for the son of man is going to come with his angels and the glory of his father. Mark 14, and Jesus said, I am, and you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Acts 1.11, then Jesus, who was being taken up from them into heaven, said, well, I will come back in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Hebrews 9.28 says, Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins for many, will appear a second time 
to save those who are eagerly awaiting. I think we have a well-established fact here in Scripture, and it's this, friends. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. See, Jesus came the first time as a helpless baby clothed in humanity. He will come a second time as a mighty king clothed in glory. Jesus came the first time as a lamb that was sacrificed for our sin. But he will come again as a lion conquering his enemies. Jesus came as a servant. He will come again to reign. Jesus came the first time and endured injustice. He will come again to bring justice. Jesus came the first time and he was judged by man. He will come again to deliver judgment upon mankind. Jesus came the first time and he conquered the grave. He will come again and he will conquer the world. He is our hope. He is our victor. Friends, he is our soon coming king. Can I hear an amen today? Revelation 19, it says this. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, there was a white horse. You may ask, why was Jesus on a white horse? Well, the answer is very easy. It's because of the gas prices. <laughs> the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and he makes war. His eyes are like flames of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him that no one, no, 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 no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he will tread the winepress on the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus will come again. Friends, I think, you know, I'm trying to cut back just all of the theological arguments and the opinions and all of these things to some facts. And my fact today is this, if you've got your outline and it's up here on the screen, Christ will return. And for the believer, it will be a day of great celebration and victory. Christ will return. And for you and I, believers, it will be a day of great celebration and victory. Hear me today. For those who believe, it will be a time of celebration. But for those who do not believe, it will be a time of great mourning. For those who have received him, it will be a time of victory. For those who have rejected him, it will be a time of regret and a time of fear. This should cause us to be about our mission. This should cause us to reach as many people as possible. Nothing matters but the souls that you bring to eternity. Amen. It'll be a time for the believer of great celebration and victory. This event that we read about today, the coming of Christ, will mark the beginning of a new era. And that's what I want to focus on today. We call that era the millennium. If you have your outlines today, I, I've got there a picture, and you see it up here too, kind of the progression of what we've talked about. We talked about the church era, the birth pains last week. We talked about the tribulation. Today, I want to talk to you about the millennial reign of Christ. There are three views on this. There's premillennial reign, which is Christ will come, and then the millennium. There's postmillennial, which there'll be the millennium, then Christ will come. And then there's amillennial, which is that the millennium is a, a symbolic thousand years that is ushering in the return of Christ. Let me tell you what all three views believe. Jesus Christ will return. He is returning for his church. In Genesis, we, we read the story of the Garden of Eden. And in the garden, Satan comes and he, he tempts mankind. And mankind falls into that sin. And sin is introduced into our world. And everything is affected by sin. Everything is tainted by sin. From mankind to the planet, it is all under the curse because of that sin. But in the millennium, everything will be restored. The planet will be restored. Humanity will be restored. God's intent will be restored for mankind. All will be as it should be. It's called the millennial age. I actually like to call it the age of restoration. Because in that time, all things will be restored 
by Christ. No matter what is happening around you, friends, whatever is going on, keep your eyes on this fact that the end he wins and the end he restores. And I want us to take a few minutes here to talk about this millennial reign. There's a lot of things we could say about it. There's a lot of points that I could have had, but there were four things I want to point out to you that will happen during the millennial reign of Christ. Number one on your outline, there will be peace. There will be peace. Isaiah 2, 4, he, Jesus, shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plows and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. There will be a time of peace. I don't know if you watched it this last week, but um, the president of Ukraine addressed the United States Congress, um, Zelensky, and he said this. He made this statement that really stuck with me. He said, um, speaking to our president, President Biden, he said, you are the leader of the United States. You are the leader of the free world. You are the leader of peace. And I thought to myself, that's a really nice statement, but it is not reality. See, no president will bring peace. No politician will bring peace. No nation will bring peace. It is only Jesus and Jesus alone that will bring peace. He is the prince of peace. And there may be peace for moments in history. There may be peace in in regions for history. But we will never have peace in our world. We will never have it because of a president or a nation or a politician. I don't, we're focused on this one war, but I don't know if you know there's 21 wars happening in the, United, in the world right now. In Ethiopia, Sudan, Algeria, Afghanistan, there's war happening all over the place. But when Jesus returns, he will bring peace because he is the leader of peace. The second thing that we know about the millennial reign of Christ is there will be great joy. There will be great joy, Isaiah 35, 10, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. I I want you to think about this because these are people that have been through tribulation, who have been through the birth pains, who have been through suffering and persecution. And it says here that they, if you read on in the verse, they will have everlasting joy that will be on their heads. Everybody say everlasting joy. There'll be everlasting joy in spite of what they were walking through. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. There'll be a time of great joy. Sadness, pain, brokenness, tragedy, hopelessness will be no more. It will be replaced by joy. How many of you know in the world we live in today that joy is a rare commodity? (laughs) Now that everyone's taken off their masks, you can see all those faces, and you don't see a lot of joy, do you? But in this reign of Christ, in this time of the millennium, joy will define mankind. Joy will define the millennium. The third thing that I want to point out to you about this time period is Satan will be bound. Revelation 20, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, referring back to the garden, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. In 1 Peter Chapter 5, verse 8, we read what Satan is up to right now in the church age. It tells us this, that Satan, our enemy in this age, is like a roaring what? Lion. And what is he doing? He's seeking someone to devour. He is busy in this age. We have a spiritual battle that you and I face today and tomorrow, every moment, every hour of our lives. Because the enemy is busy in this age, seeking someone to devour The devil, listen to me, is not taking any days off. He is working overtime. Do you know why? Because he knows his time is short, and he knows he's a defeated foe. And so he is working, and he's about his business. The fourth thing I want you to see about the millennium is that Jesus will reign. Everyone say, Jesus will reign. Jesus will reign. Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, 
when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, which is referring to Jesus, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Revelation 24 says this, they, the martyred, came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. See, Jesus will take his rightful place. Jesus will rule the earth. It'll be a kingdom that shall never pass away. It'll be a righteous ruler. It'll be a true ruler. It will be a just ruler. And I've got news for you sitting here in the United States of America in a democratic nation that we love, democracy. There will be no elections. There will be no democratic process. There will be no certification by Congress. King Jesus will take his throne and he will reign. And the book of Philippians chapter 2 says that this of it, at that moment, that every knee shall bow. Every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I don't want to wait till that moment. Amen. Every knee will bow. It'll be a time, the millennium will be a time of peace and joy. Satan will be bound. And Jesus will reign. Friends, no matter what's going on around us, let's give the Lord praise for the future that we behold. Amen. What a great future we have. And we read the end here in the Bible. So this is the amazing thing about all these things that I pulled out about the millennium. I mean, we're talking the entire world. This is going to happen in the entire world at some point. But this is the amazing thing, friends. You can experience all these things now in your life. You can experience all these things at this moment in your life. We read here about a future world, but it's also a promise to believers today. I, I want you to hear me. Listen, you can have peace now in your life. You can have peace at this moment in your life. I've been walking through with one of our, our pastors here in the section who lost his son in a motorcycle accident in November devastating thing it's it's unbelievable the pain that they have felt and the things that they have gone through i had lunch with him the other day let me tell you what he's been through it but he's never been without peace see the world around you friends can be going to hell and you can still have peace in your life it's a promise of jesus in john chapter 14 my peace i leave with you he didn't tell us there, hey, disciples, hey, you're going to have to wait for it. When I come back, you'll get it. He didn't say, hey, Christians throughout history, you're going to have to wait for it. When, when I come back, you'll get it. He says, my peace I leave with you. And he says this, it's not a peace that the world can give you. You can't find it out there. You can't find it. And he says this, do not be troubled and you don't have to be afraid. Philippians 4 calls it a peace that passes all understanding. And friends, it's great to talk about the future, but I want you to know in your heart, the future can be now. You can have peace in your life. Some of you, you've had peace stripped of you for years. You can have peace in your life today because of Jesus. Can I hear an amen? You can have peace. The other thing I want you to see is you can have joy now. You can have joy now in your life. I, I was in Cuba and and the churches there are under great oppression by the government, and they could be wiped out at any moment, and they hide the churches in the jungle, or they hide them connected to the back of pastor's houses. And, and you would walk through, and you go to these churches, and at any moment, the government could come along and arrest the pastors and bulldoze the churches, which has happened the la even the last couple of years. Those pastors, though, in the midst of all that pressure, they were some of the most joyous people I've ever met in my life. The people would gather in those churches under a threat, and I would think they would sing real quiet. But they sang at the top of their lungs because they were filled with joy. I went to Haiti after the earthquake with all the devastation and all the tragedy. Those were the most joyous churches I've ever preached at or been to in my life. Do you know why? Because joy is not based on outside circumstances, but an inside position. You can have joy no matter what's happening around you. And the text gives us that good news. Because the end, you will not have joy in the process, but you will have joy in the end result. 
See, listen, the, 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 it will be hard, yes. Will you enjoy the things you go through in your life? No. Remember, he talks about birth pains. That birth pain, but the end, at the end, you will have joy in it. See, you can have joy in the midst of all of it because you know the end of the story. Hear me, in your life, adversity, hear me, may steal enjoyment, but it will never steal joy when you know Jesus. You can go through things you don't enjoy, but you will have joy on the inside, and it's available to you today. I'm so thankful I don't have to wait <laughs> to the millennium, but I can have it now in my life. The third thing is you can bind Satan now. Turn to the person next to you, now that we can talk to people next to us again, all right, we don't have the six-foot rule, and tell them you can bind Satan. You have power over Satan. You know, I um, two Sundays ago, two Sunday nights ago, I had a dream. I don't have these types of dreams very often. Um, <clears throat> I usually forget all my dreams. I don't have super spiritual dreams. I usually don't have, like, violent dreams. But I had this dream that these, um, we had a great service like we're having today. Everyone left, and there was a few people left over here in the corner. And um, everybody had left except for staff members. They went over, and they said, hey, we're going to close up because it was getting a long time, and we're still there. And they said, we're not leaving. So um, Brandon and Jamie came up to me and said, hey, we're going to take off. They're not leaving, right? They abandoned me in my dream. So they're like, hey, we're out. <laughs> we're out of here. These people are difficult to deal with. We're out. So I'm like, okay. So I went over there. Everybody's gone. It's just me. They're sitting over here talking, mid-20s, two guys and a girl. I walked over there. I said, hey, guys, sorry. We're going to lock up. It's late in the afternoon now. Um, I'm going to have to ask you guys to leave. And the guy looked at me and said, I'm not leaving. And I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to have to take things into my own hands now. All right? So I went over to the guy, and I grabbed him, <clears throat> and I started to pull him. I, I'm, you're, you're out. It's not the first time I've ever kicked somebody out of a church. I've done this before, all right? Um, one time. Oh, that's another story. All right? <clears throat> so I, I grabbed him. I'm pulling him to come out of the church, and he starts fighting me, and he starts beating on me, and he turns into a demon, like an evil-looking demon, and he comes over me like a huge demon. At that moment, okay, praise the Lord, I had my gun on me, and I pulled out my gun, and I shot the demon, Amen. Come on. What a pastor. I shot him in the head, okay? And I remember that moment. I shot him in the head, and he, his head came back, and he came back a bigger demon. Friends, I want you to hear me today. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. You cannot battle demons like that. You can't battle demons in the supernatural. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and spiritual darkness and in high places. But you have been given the tools. You have been given the authority. It says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not of this world, but they are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. The book of James chapter 4 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You have power. You have authority in this age. Let me tell you what. We're looking at the future thing. In the end, Jesus will win the war. Can I hear an amen? But guess what? Right now, you can win the battles. You can win the battle of your day. You can win the battle in the hour, in the moments, over your family, over your mind, over all the things happening in your life. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. Come on, let's give him praise today. Greater is he that is, you have authority, friends. The fourth thing is Jesus can reign in you now. I, I want you to hear me today. It's not about who reigns around you. It's not about who is reigning in our nation and or our world, but it's about who reigns inside of you. Those that have been around me for a while as a pastor, you know I'm not obsessed with the kingdom around me. I'm obsessed with the kingdom that reigns in me. People have tried to push me into political stuff like never before in the last two and a half years. And I don't do it. I don't go there. Some, uh, I, by the way, God may raise up politicians from our church and people that are involved in politics. We need people called to do that. But I have a different calling on my life. And when everybody's been saved, I'll go to politics. All right? People have tried to push me in this church. I, and I'm so disappointed. I have pastors I really respected. And that they're, they're no longer obsessed with, with the kingdom that we're supposed to be advancing. They're 100% obsessed with politics. 
And you get on their Facebook and it's just post after post after post, nasty post after nasty post about politics and nothing about church and nothing about what God is doing in their region and nothing about anything that has to do with the other kingdom. And you all know the scriptures out of the abundance of the heart, the heart, the Facebook speaketh. What is in here is coming out there because We've become obsessed with all the things happening around us and we've forgotten who rules within us. And friends, as the church, it's time for us to refocus because we are going to have evil men that reign around us. It is never going to end, but it's about who reigns inside of you. And when he reigns in you, you have peace, you have joy, and you have authority when you establish his reign in your heart. And I want you to hear me today. For the Christian, Christ will return and it will be a day of great celebration and it will be a day of great victory. But sitting here today in the middle of the crazy world that we live in, you can experience that reign in your life today. He will come when you invite him to reign in your life and he will exchange fear with peace. He will take your your heaviness and he will give you joy he will exchange your defeat for victory i, I want to invite you to stand right now all over this place now, he will change your fear for peace he will exchange your heaviness for joy he will take your defeat and he will give you victory this is what i want you to do all over this place if you would with me if you feel comfortable doing it I'm going to read those one more time. When you establish his reign, here's the things you will do. Peace, joy, and victory. And as I read them, I want to invite you to do this. If you, with every eye closed and head bowed right now. If that speaks to you, if you're here today and you have fear and you need peace, just lift your hands at that moment. If you're here today and you have heaviness and you need joy, lift your hands at that moment. If you're here today and you just defeat happening in your life, establish his reign in your life. Hear me today. He will change your fear for peace. If you need that today, lift your hands. He will exchange your heaviness and the depression and the sadness that grip your life. He'll exchange it for joy. And friends, he will take your defeat and he will give you victory. He will take the things that are defeating you. He will give you the authority some future event. You can have celebration. You can have victory. You can have joy.
Part of my, my house, one side of my house, I pass. I don't pass by very often because I don't drive around into my driveway that way, and so I don't pass this area very often, but I knew there was a lot of weeds growing up over there, and and um, so yesterday I decided I would tackle the weeds, so I went over there and I spent some time pulling weeds, and my wife and one of my kids came over to me, and they said, why are you pulling weeds? And one of them said, why didn't you spray them? I said, well, I've sprayed them twice, and now they look dead, half dead, they're ugly, um, and then my wife said, well, whatever you want to do, go for it. And I said, well, sometimes a man has just got to pull his weeds, right? Sometimes you just got to, you got to pull your weeds. You've tried everything else. You just got to take the time. You got to pull them out. She goes, well, why? We don't, we don't drive over here. She goes, I said, yeah, because all the neighbors have to look at it, and I want it to look good. Now, listen, weeds destroy things that are beautiful. Those weeds were making that side of my, ug- my house ugly, and now I pulled them up, and it, beauty can come from that. And friends, today, this is what I feel God wants to do. He wants you to allow him. He wants you to take the time to pull some weeds out of your life, some weeds out of your life. Some of you have some weeds that are deeply implanted in you. And sometimes a man or a woman has just got to take the time to pull the weeds, to get them out of your life. Do you know why? Because when you have those in your life, you can't have the beautiful things. You can't have the joy. You can't have the peace. You don't have the authority. And you need to allow those weeds to be pulling in your life right now. All over this place. I'm going to invite you. If you close your eyes. Now, this is how it happens because some of you are like, great analogy. I'm confused. This is how it happens, okay? Right now, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to do it. Allow the Holy Spirit to search your heart and your mind. Because some of you are filled with a lot of other things and you're not feeling the peace and the joy because you're filled with the weeds. So allow the Holy Spirit to show you what those things are right now. This is the opportunity. You either build walls to those things, you dismiss them, you get judgmental about somebody else instead of just dealing with your own weeds, okay? My neighbors weren't going to come deal with my weeds. you got to deal with your own weeds. Don't build 
build a wall against the Holy Spirit right now. Let him search you. Let him put his finger on where the weeds are at in your life. Come on, let him do that right now, just for a moment. Where are those places? Now you got to pull them out. How do I pull out weeds out of my life? Well, it's called confession. So right now, just confess those things to him. I confess that thought. I confess that action. I confess that anxiety I've allowed to grip me. I, can, I confess that fear I've allowed to dominate my life. I confess that, that I've let that abuse that happened many years ago affect every moment of my future. I, I confess these things. I see them as weeds. I, I confess that bitterness I've allowed to anchor into my life. Let, let there be confession right now. Confession in your heart. Come on, these are the things. We, we preach a nice message, but these are the things that actually matter right here. Allowing the Holy Spirit to do this. Come on, allow Him to do this. What are the weeds that you need to pull? I confess those things. He brings them up. Confess them right now. Don't build a wall. Don't build This is where spiritual growth happens. This is how you advance in your life. Confess those to Him. Let Him pull those things up right now. Let Him pull those things up. And as he does that, let's just pray. Just plead the blood of Jesus over that area of your life. I plead the authority of Jesus over those things. I plead the cross. I plead the blood of Jesus over those things. I don't give them place in my life. Everyone say those two words. I don't give them place. Come on, say, I don't give them place. I don't give them place in my life anymore. I plead the blood. I plead the cross over those things. I found this is really important because now you've got you hold the weeds, you, you've pleaded the blood of Jesus over them, the authority of Jesus over them. This is really important. You gotta close the door to them. So right now, just say, I close the door. I want everybody, even if you're not doing this, just pray to say these words with me. I close the door. I close the door to those things. I'm not gonna allow them to have space in my life anymore. I pull the weed and I throw it away right now. I give it no place in my life. I give it no authority in my life. I give it no dominion in my life. Jesus reigns in my life. Come on, just say those words. Jesus reigns. Jesus reigns. Jesus reigns in my life. And this is what I always do. This is so important after I've done that in my own life. Come on, pull up the weed. Then I just give him praise. Then I give him thanks for what he's done. Come on, let's give him praise right now. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We pull those things out of my life. We thank you.
rich things in your word. Man, we have giving. Don't forget to give. We've got our, uh, our giving um, stations on the walls as you walk out any door and also electronic giving out there. Um, and thank you for being here today. Thank you for being part of our service. Um, Galt people, people that are part of the Galt campus, you can go to the Life Center as soon as you can. And we've got some sandwiches over there for you. And love to connect with you over there. God bless you. God bless you. Don't rush off.